discussing about examination and investigation in obstetrics and gynecology by Dr. Divya Sias. Next, I like to invite Dr. Tulia Mohandas, Vice Principal Ayurveda College Coimbatore, to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, ma'am. Good evening to all. I welcome everyone in today's session. On behalf of Ayurveda College Coimbatore and uh, the team Deeksha, it's my honor to welcome Dr. Divya CS, ma'am, in today's section. Thank you, um, you ma'am. I'm very, uh, you know, uh, very happy that ma'am, you that you offer, uh, accepted our offer. And ma'am is going to speak about the various examinations and investigations and, uh, which we can carry out in gynecology and obstetrics, which I think we, uh, as an Ayurvedic practitioners, many of us uh, are not well aware of. So it is uh, 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 it's something which is hidden on to be more explored for many of us. So I, I think by the end of the session, we'll be getting a rich treasure of knowledge and everyone will be learning a lot from this session. So you, uh, with this uh, note, I welcome again one and all. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Divya Siyas, ma'am. Ma'am completed a BAMS from Sri Jayendra Saraswati Ayurveda College, Chennai and pursued her diploma in clinical research and clinical data management from Pune University and did her PG in Prasudhi Tandra and Sri Roga from the SDM College of Ayurveda, Udupi and did her thesis on Garbini Rasayana. She also pursued her Hatha Yoga teacher's training course from Shivanada Ashram, Netala, Himalayas. Ma'am also completed Fellowship in Medical Cosmetology from Institute of Laser and Aesthetic Medicine, Bangalore. She has a working experience of nine years in teaching and clinical practice. And ma'am is currently the HOD and Associate Professor, Department of Prasiddhi Tandra and Sri Roka, Shantagiri Ayurveda Medical College and Hospital, Palatkar, Kerala. We are very proud to have you here on the session today, ma'am. So without any further ado, let's hand over the session to respected Dr. Divya, ma'am to enlighten our minds with our knowledge. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Team Deeksha and Ayurveda College Coimbatore. Thank you, madam, uh, for the opportunity. So probably we have just one hour. So probably, yeah, probably I will uh, just uh, jump into the topic itself. So I, I am presuming that I am addressing uh, doctors who are practicing, uh, who are exposed to the clinical practice, and also students who are interns or somebody who is into practice. So we will uh, get into the uh, examination part. So my topic is examination and investigation in gynec and obstetric practice, clinical practice. So some of the prerequisites for gynecological examination. So most of the times as BAMS doctors or Ayurvedic doctors, and also uh, when, um, especially, uh, I don't uh, do any bias here, but still, uh, women uh, feel approachable to come to female doctors. So prob even though uh, people are not aware of a specialty subject called Prasudhi Tantra and Sri Roga in Ayurveda, women doctors uh, will be uh, sought out for any problem in their private life or when they have uh, hesitancy in addressing certain uh, issues regarding uh, their gynecological issues. So they, they will be opting for a gynecological doctor for primarily or an Ayurvedic doctor who is a female. So most of the times uh, they will come to you. So it is important for all the Ayurvedic doctors to understand on the basic examination of uh, gynecological and obstetrical practice. So some of the prerequisite is uh, since we are addressing uh, problems which are very private in origin, so it is important to have a consent of the patient. The primarily, we, you have to brief up what you are going to do with the patient, what all parts will be exposed. And it is very important for the patient to have a gist of what the examination is going to be, which is very important. So primarily, it will be the consent of the patient. Number two, next is something which I have not written in the slide. But if you are a, a private practitioner or a, a general practitioner, it will be uh, it will be best to have a uh, assistant to help you with the examination. Uh, 
primarily because you need assistance when you are going for a perspicillum examination or something like that you might uh, need a light resource or sometimes you need an extra hand for speculum examination and also to the matter for a legal uh, matter also why because uh, it is always since we are uh, doing a private examination there is always chances to protect our um, uh, pro protect our, ourselves from some of the misleading uh, people sometimes it is always uh, better to have a third person to understand what is going around in the inside the uh, examination examination room or the procedure room so it will be always best to have a, an assistant so uh, three people should be there for all the examination next is uh, we will require the patient to actually uh, empty their bladder first uh, empty their rectum and with good ventilation and good light resource and all the internal organs should be examined with a sterile glove uh, it goes without saying sterile lubricant if necessary speculum sponge holding forceps and swabs uh, all these things may be required so position of the patient so patient uh, the best position to examine the private area especially the pervaginal per speculum examination it is better to even though when it's an inspection of the uh, vaginal area it is always best to have the patient in lithotomy position it is always best to have an examination table which have the uh, facility for lithotomy position so mostly we will do the examinations in sims position uh, that is uh, in, uh, when you are examining or inspecting the anterior vagina wall and the cervix lateral position when you are inspecting the anal, anal part or per rectal examination perineum posterior parts of the vulva vagina and cervix and lithotomy position is there another option that is for vaginal operations or minor uh, surgeries under anesthesia and dorsal position for inspection of vulva and for bimanual examination so this will be basically a brush of uh, of the third year syllabus uh, examination next inspection of the vulva so what we have to inspect so there are uh, see how how, how do we uh, conclude at a diagnosis uh, of a patient and the patient come to you they express their difficulties so what can be the difficulty many many difficulties are there primarily we can talk about primary amenorrhea a, a, a girl who is around the age of 16 or 18 years coming to you with a parent who uh, says that she complains of uh, primary amenorrhea there has been no menstruation at all so in that condition you have to look into the secondary sexual characters and then we have to inspect for what have, uh, if there any is there is any anatomical defect uh, defect in the external uh, genital or uh, area so inspection of the vulva it is always we go with the ayurvedic uh, Ay ayurvedic nidana uh, parikshas uh, that is darshana sparshana prashnayi so first it will be the inspection of darshana to note any anatomical abnormality starting from the development of the pubic hair clitoris labia majora minora and the perineum and next is to note any palpable pathology over the area and to note any character of the visible vaginal discharge if there is any uh, discharges or any abnormality seen uh, when you are uh, having uh, the first look then by ex uh, after the inspection uh, or looking uh, thoroughly around the area then you go for an examination primarily we will go for a normal general examination where you separate the labia using the fingers of your left hand to note any urethral meatus bartholin's ducts if there is any you can see in the picture the location of the bartholin's gland and it is not visible unless there is a, an inflammation or an abscess in the bartholin's gland the uh, uh, the glands will not be visible even uh, it will be puffed up it will be swollen a little bit when there is an infection infection or an abscess so if it is enlarged or not and you have to see the characteristics of a hymen especially in uh, conditions like an imperforate hymen it is a uh, uh, abnormality that is the development of abnormality of the genital tract in such conditions also you can find there is a uh, primary amenorrhea so characteristics of the hymen if it's an imperforate hymen or if there is any hymenal abnormality we'll move on to the next slide now comes to the per speculum examination after inspection and after general examination we will go for the per speculum examination so per speculum examination the name itself says that you are using a speculum to visualize the 
internal parts of the uh, genitalia so first you will be you will be using two types of speculum so in the next slide i will be showing so i will move on to the next slide to show uh, people who don't know you can go through the slide here uh, here there are some instruments which is uh, shown on the right side of the slide the first one is the cusco speculum second one is the anterior vaginal wall retractor which is used with the third picture that is the sim speculum so uh, all these instruments are used for speculum examination. So, for speculum examination is generally done to visualize the vaginal canal and the cervix. So, we have to look into the vaginal canal if there is any inflammation or outgrowth or polyps in the cervical uh, uh, region, or you can also visualize the cervical os. If it is a nulliparous os or a multiparous os, you, you may see that in a nulliparous os that it is a very dot-like structure, the cervical os will be. And when it is a multiparous os or who, somebody who have delivered, it will be a, some, somewhat like a slit-like. So all those things you can see. Also for minor uh, diagnostic procedures like cervical scra scrape cytology, endocervical sampling, etc., we may use speculum for extracting the or aspirating the scrape or the swab cervical or vaginal discharge when there is a suspicious cervical or vaginal discharge we go for a uh, speculum examination and collect the discharge for uh, for the laboratory tests or microscopical tests it is so uh, while i was uh, introducing in the uh, previous uh, uh, this slide where prerequisites was mentioned sterile lubricant was mentioned but it is always um, it's always best not to use any lubricants un unless and until it is very necessary for the patient. For some patient, there will be a rigid vaginal canal or patient who are uh, not very cooperative in such conditions, hesitant patient, we may use lubricants. Otherwise, what happens is if you lose, use any lubricants while examining or while doing a perspeculum examination, if you see something suspicious, the lubricants can actually inter uh, intervene with the actual results of the swab so when you are collecting a swab it will be mixed up with the lubricants so that you won't get the right result so it's always better to go for a speculum examination without any antiseptic solutions or lubricants and after this you can go for a vaginal examination where you can use the lubricants i hope it is clear any any doubts you can ask at the end of the class so uh, you can note these things now going to the next slide these are the uh, instruments which are used in the perspeculum examination. So approximately we will be uh, using the uh, speculum as per the size of the vaginal canal. So in the sim speculum, that is the third uh, uh, picture, you can see uh, the two blades of the sim speculum will be having a different size. One will be bigger than the other. So you can uh, actually look into the pervaginal canal of the uh, canal of the patient and decide which part of the speculum to use. So it should be pre-warm to avoid discomfort or uh, cold, but it should not be too uh, too warm also. Uh, what, what mistakes we uh, do during uh, the perspeculum examination is that we will put the instruments in the sterilizer and we will take it and insert. So it will be too hot for the patient. It's a very sensitive area, the mucous membrane of the, it will be very sensitive. So make sure that it is um, optimum warm, uh, not too cold or no, not too hot. And lubricating gel, if it is absolutely necessary or you can avoid it, then first we have to separate the labia with your left hand and then slightly uh, you can insert the speculum using your right hand in a 90 degree in a perpendicular position and slide it down to the uh, posterior vagina wall, uh, posterior vagina wall. So the speculum is introduced through the introitus with the, uh, uh, with the jaws in vertical position. So it is uh, gently rotated when being and uh, when being advanced into horizontal plane. So that is how it is done. Now, going to the next. Uh, so here uh, I am uh, in the picture. You can see it's a Casco speculum which is used here. The advantage of a Casco speculum compared to the Sim speculum is that uh, Casco, when you're uh, inserting, you have to be very careful. There are chances that the vaginal canal will be trapped in between the blades of the cusco speculum. So very careful, the size of the speculum should be very, uh, uh, it, it should be approximated to the vaginal canal of the, uh, the size of the vaginal canal of the patient. 
But the advantage of uh, Cusco speculum is that you don't need an assistant. You can fix it with a screw. There is a screw which can which you can adjust as per the size of the uh, vaginal canal and fix it. And you can actually go back and take any uh, so if you need to do a cervical swab or if you if you think that it's a suspicious discharge and you need to go for a pap smear, you can go and take it. But if you are using a sim speculum, you cannot remove your hands. So that is the advantage of a Cusco speculum. So these are the advantages and disadvantages. So, uh, so slide, this is also after closing both the blades of the Cusco speculum, it is inserted perpendicularly and it is rotated uh, in the position which you can see. Uh, in the second picture, you can see how it is fixed, the uh, Cusco speculum. And now there, there will be screw on the right side of the Cusco speculum, which you can tighten as per the size of the vaginal canal. We'll move on to the next slide. Now, uh, next is the, uh, so the first speculum examination part is over. So here you have to, uh, what are things you have to note during the first speculum examination is that you have to see if there is any outgrowth or inflammation in the vaginal canal, if there is any suspicious discharge, blood stain discharge, or um, the water, what is the color of the discharge, whether there are any flakes in the vaginal canal, all those things will help you in diagnosing the kind of infection the patient has uh, is, is exposed to. And also the size, uh, the position of the cervix, how it is pointed, whether it is pointed downwards posteriorly or upwards anteriorly, whether the size of the uh, uh, cervical os, whether it is a nulliparous or multiparous os, or whether there are any outgrowths like any lesions or outgrowths or polyps, all those things can be noted with the help of perspeculum examination. When the perspeculum examination is normal, what you write in a, uh, what, whenever you are doing an examination, you have to write it down in your prescription as a proof of what you have seen uh, during the examination. So that uh, if further, when the patient is uh, referred to another physician or another doctor or specialty doctor, they will understand what you have uh, seen there. So that is one thing. And uh, so here you can, uh, when the perspeculum examination is normal, you can say that uh, perspeculum examination, uh, no discharge, no white discharge, uh, 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 there is no congestion, etc. you can write. Now, moving on to the, Next part of the examination, that is the digital examination or pervaginal examination. So here also the labia are generally parted with your left hand and the two digits are inserted. The index finger and the middle finger is inserted into the vaginal canal and uh, the patient should relax. You have to tell the patient to take uh, two or three uh, inhalation or uh, breaths. Slowly you can insert and you have to feel for what all things. That will be the next question. You have to feel with, uh, feel the position of the uterine uterus, whether the uterus is antiverted or retroverted. So here you can see that uh, in the second uh, picture, you can see it is an antiverted uterus. So you can see that the cervix is actually pointing downwards posteriorly. So in perspeculum examination also, you can see that the cervix is pointing to the posterior vaginal wall. When it is retroverted, opposite to the, whatever you are seeing in the picture, the it will be very easy to access the cervix during perspeculum examination. So, uh, in uh, you have to look into the position of the uterine uterus. You have to see the consistency of the uterus, whether it is a small uterus, whether it is a normal size or a bulky uterus. It is a bimanual examination. When why, why we are calling it as a bimanual examination is that we are also uh, uh, your right hand will be palpating the vaginal canal, the uterus, etc., while your left hand will be over the abdomen. So there is an abdominal and pervaginal examination happening simultaneously. That is why the digital examination is called as a bimanual examination. So you have to uh, palpate for the uterus. So uterus, the position of the uterus, the site of the uterus, whether, uh, and also the next thing will be to feel the adnexa, adnexal, uh, you have to uh, see the fornixes, fornices and fornix. Fornix is the space or the recess between the cervical canal, cervi cervix, which is protruding into the vaginal canal. So there will be four, uh, four, uh, four sides of the cervix protruding into the vaginal canal, left lateral, right, right lateral, anterior and posterior fornix or fornices. You have to feel all the four uh, fornices 
and simultaneously you have to look for any mass or tenderness in the in those areas for example if you are looking into the left lateral fornix you have to press the left lateral part of the uh, part of your hands on the abdomen so to look into any masses or any tenderness for example if there is a uh, left ovarian cyst which is quite big you may be able to palpate the cyst so if you palpate a mass on the left lateral fornix you will write it as there is a mass on the left lateral fornix and you can further confirm it with the ultrasonography so always it is better to understand these basic abnormalities during the examination itself and only for confirmation we will send it for a investigation i hope you understood we will move on to the next slide so here these things i have already uh, spoken about it is about position whether the position of the uterus is whether it's antiverted or retroverted the station normally uh, the station of the uterus is seen especially in uh, obstetric practice but in gynecological practice also we will see it for uh, in any um, genital prolapse for in conditions of genital prolapse where there is a descent of the cervical uh, os down into the vaginal canal sometimes it is protruded outside Th those conditions you will look into the station then texture if it is a pregnant or a non pregnant uterus whether it is bulky if there is a fibroid in the uterus you may feel that it is stony hard in such conditions also you may palpate uh, the peripdominal hand can be palpated now the shape of the uterus shape of the uterus is also something which you uh, do in obstetric practice tenderness ah, rocking of the cervix so uh, one of the most important cardinal feature in pelvic inflammatory disease uh, pid is tenderness on rocking of cervix associated with fever and lower abdominal pain so when you are uh, doing a digital examination you will try to move or rock the cervix if there is presence of tenderness you may suspect a pid that is one of the reason there can be other reasons also there can there can be lesions or sometimes there is a uh, adhesions all those things can be there so you have to find find why what is the reason behind the tenderness that is the second part first will be the diagnosis now consistency of the cervix is also another thing that, that i missed out saying whether it is soft it will be very soft during pregnancy and very firm when it is a non pregnant cervix so moving on to the next slide so so gen general per vaginal examination or by manual examination so we will we have seen all these things i will repeat it again two fingers of the right hand kept in the vaginal canal and uh, palmar surface of the left hand is kept on the anterior abdominal wall below the umbilicus that is by manual examination what all things are we going to palpate we will be palpating the uterus to look into the position size shape mobility tenderness and presence of any uterine pathology in case of retroverted it is felt through the posterior fornix that is uh, something which i missed out normally uterus is antiverted pear shape firm and freely mobile in all direction these are all things which you have already learned then palpation of uterine appendages for palpation of uh, adnexa that is fingers are placed in the lateral fornices and pushed backwards uh, and upwards so you have you can see if there are any palpable mass or if there are any enlarged palpable uh, uh, masses or tenderness all those things can be uh, palpated by by manual examination when the ovary is mobile sensitive to manual pressure it is palpable you have you may have to look into whether if there is any cyst now pouch of douglas that is a posterior vaginal wall examine through the lateral fornix to recognize the uterus from the adnexal mass if there is any adnexal mass is there if there is any mass in the pouch of douglas all those things can be felt now moving on to the next slide so some of the gynecological conditions i have uh, uh, put here for the practitioners in cervicitis you can see uh, the the picture shows there is a normal cervix and a cervix which has inflammation inflammation or cervicitis so here it there will be mucopurulent offensive vaginal discharge that you can see when you are going for a per vaginal examination or per speculum examination cervix is tender tender when you are touching the cervix the patient will feel pain and the cervix may look edematous and congested congested is the normal uh, color of the cervix will be light pink in color when there is a congestion you will see that something like a fresh wound it will be red redness will be there congested uh, look will be there 
on the cervix. Now coming to the next uh, disease that is cervical erosion, which is very common. We know how what cervical erosion is when the uh, the uh, th there are two types of uh, tissues in the endocervix and ecto ectocervix. When the uh, the cells or the tissues from the endocervix uh, comes and pass on to the ectocervix, there will be cervical erosion. Just like how we call about so soil erosion, there is cervical erosion. So squamous, uh, squamous columnar, uh, so uh, columnar epithelium will be coming out and getting attached to the ectocervix. So uh, it will be crossing the T zone, TZ and uh, you can see the cervical erosion. So when there is um, columnar epithelium found on the ectocervix, what you will do, you will try to remove it by cauterization. Most of the times you will be removing it with the cauterization or we will uh, we will be in Ayurveda, there are very good medicine for cervical erosion like Tanganakshara can be applied. Also, uh, this Pipaliyadi Varti, which can be applied externally for a very minimum time. You, have, you can put it in a gauze and keep it there once uh, the patient will uh, will express there is a, a burning sensation, you can remove it and you can wash with nalpamaradi kashaya or something. So in such conditions, in cervical erosion, uh, you, you can see congestion cervical erosion, bright red area, lesion may be smooth, having small papillary folds that you can see. If you look, you look very closely, you need a very good source of light to see this, neither tender nor bleeds on touch. Bleeding on touch is another uh, difficulty. Mostly when uh, we will be seeing in carcinoma of cervix, it's a very important uh, sign in carcinoma of cervix, bleed, contact bleeding or bleed on touch. On rubbing with cross piece, there may be multiple spots. That is, these are all the signs of cervical erosion, the diagnostic examination for cervical erosions here. Now we will move on to the next slide. Next is fibroid uterus, uterine fibroid. Uh, how to uh, assess it with gynecological examination. So uterus, uh, when you're palpating the, uh, by manually, when you're examining the uh, uterine cavity, per-abdominally, you will be feel, feeling that there is an irregularly enlarged swelling per-abdominally. So uterine swelling is evidenced by uterus not felt separated from the swelling. So continuously, it will be the swelling will be continuous with the uterine cavity, but it will be bulging out to a different zone. So that is how it is felt and cervix moves with the movement of the tumor. So why, 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 if you're trying to manipulate the upper abdominal uh, swelling or the tumor and you have your uh, digits uh, inserted into the vaginal canal, you are uh, you have touching the cervix, you will feel that when the tumor is being moved or the swelling is being moved, you will feel the cervix being moved. That These are the signs which help you uh, understand or diagnose uterine fibro. To confirm it again, you will have to go for an ultrasonography. So here you can see there are different, uh, as per this uh, locality or the location of the fibroid, it is uh, named separately as subserous fibroid when it's outside the uterus, submural fibroid when it's in the muscular layer or the middle layer. And uh, then there is an intramural fibroid and uh, there is uh, there is subserosal, submucosal, submucosal fibroid when it is in the inside the um, in the innermost layer of the uterus. Submucus, intramural, and intramural is the muscular layer, and subserosal. Then pedungulated fibroid, when you can see that there is a pedicle or there is a, uh, there it is separated from the uterine cavity. Now, uh, the next disease will be pelvic inflammatory disease. Uh, we, uh, we all know that cervical carcinoma, most of the times, uh, pelvic, a, a person having a history of pelvic, pelvic inflammatory disease is prone to have uh, this cervical carcinoma. So always, uh, when you're uh, looking into PID, it is always important that they get a very good result. They get a cure. And uh, we have to also make sure that the disease will not advance to the next level. Even uh, you have to try and curb the disease at, a, at the earliest uh, earliest age possible. So mostly we will see pelvic inflammatory disease in uh, women around the age of reproductive age. In uh, Ayurveda, we uh, we uh, probably correlate it under Pitala Yoni Vyapat. And sometimes Kafaja Yoni Vyapat also in certain condition. So if, the, if it is associated with an infection. So purulent vaginal discharge is one of the uh, signs in uh, pelvic inflammatory diseases, disease and congested external urethral meatus uh, most of the times, not necessarily 
the sign is not uh, not a hundred percent is necessary uh, necessary for uh, diagnosing PID. For speculative examination, you can see congested cervix for, with purulent discharge. By manual um, examination, increased tenderness in the cortex. So you can see uh, what I have mentioned in the previous slide. It is tenderness in rocking of cervix. So we will move on to the always associated with fever also in PID. Now going to the next uh, part of the talk today, that is examination in obstetrics. So some of the most important diseases I have told, uh, which is relevant for examination. And uh, there are some other uh, investigations also in certain gynecological examination. So I have just uh, mentioned about the examination here. Now pervaginal examination obstetrics. Pervaginal uh, obstetric examination, we have first per abdominal examination. That is the most important thing. So there is something called Ferguson's reflex. You might have studied and forgotten. I don't know. So Fergu Ferguson's reflex is it, is, it is always best to avoid pervaginal examination during uh, an antenatal period and during pregnancy because there is always a chance of eliciting uterine contraction due to Ferguson's reflex. So better to avoid it. Uh, and per abdominal examination and auscultation is very important in uh, during or throughout the obstetric period or antenatal care. So we will avoid pervaginal examination unless and until it is very much required. So uh, otherwise, USG will tell you uh, and per abdominal examination will actually help you in understanding how the pregnancy is going about. So in obstetric, uh, in pervaginal examination, obstetric has its own place during ANC, labor and Purpural period. So, gyneco uh, unlike the gynecological condition, pervaginal in obstetric requires some special precautions and technical skill. See, it is always better do uh, we have to do the pervaginal examination in a very short time, assess all possible um, assessments within minimum time. That is very important. So, the skill, uh, technical skill, is very important in obstetric uh, pervaginal examination than in gynecological pervaginal examination. So inspection, the perineum inspected, that external genitalia for any pathological lesions of discharge, per speculum examination to visualize the cervix and vaginal wall. So you, you can see these pictures there. Now, prerequisites are as you can access all possible. Um, so uh, am I audible? Is there something going on? No, you ma'am, you're audible, ma'am. Yeah, uh, you can always uh, interrupt me in middle if I have gone uh, because the internet uh, connection, I think it is uh, fluctuating here. No, so, ma'am, your voice is clear, ma'am. Clear, okay, thank you. So gen in uh, general pervaginal examination, some of the prerequisite, the first prerequisite will be consent. Then it is important uh, to have the patient um, uh, lie down in lithotomy position. Uh, we, we have to explain each and every step to the patient what you are going to do. So most of the times the patient will be in agony and patient uh, if in advanced uh, stages of pregnancy, patient might feel difficult to lie on the back. So it is, you have to do it very quickly and you have to make the patient understand what all things are, why you are doing it. Most of the times it is not happening in a very uh, rushed up clinic where there are people waiting uh, one by one behind. So uh, it is better if somebody uh, during the waiting time, if somebody can explain what is going on, or you can always have a printed uh, paper on uh, in this uh, a, a gestational age, you will be looking into these things per, with pervaginal examination, per speculum examination. So that will actually reassure the patient on why the pa uh, uh, doctor is examining. So that is one thing which is very important. Ask the patient to evacuate her bladder. It is important to evacuate the bladder and the rectum so that it will not interfere with the examination. It will not, the, uh, the doctor will not confuse uh, the bladder or the rectum uh, for something else. So it is important to have a very clear area for examination. And ask the patient to lie down in supine position with knee flex, like how it is shown in the figure. And a sheet may be placed covering her abdomen, genitalia. Prefer uh, preferably, you can always, when you're going for a per per speculum or per vaginal examination, if you have a private clinic also, it is important you uh, pay, make the patient as comfortable as possible. So if you have a whole towel, it is very uh, easy to get it done. You, if you buy, uh, buy a whole tissue, um, a, a tissue like uh, cloth, 
which is disposable, something like uh, what you what is what it is available as uh, covers and all. If you put a hole in between and keep it sterile, you can always it will be very uh, even when you are doing a vasti karma or you are doing a rectal examination or rectal examination, it is better to you have some whole towels ready uh, in your examination room or procedure room. So procedure should be performed in presence of a female third party, a nurse or a midwife or an assistant. Where I, where, where sterile glove. All perspiculum examination should be perspiculum or perigenal examination should be done with a sterile glove because there is always a chance of giving an infection to the patient. Hydrogenic infections um, as are easily uh, easily given to the patient from the clinic because there are so many other gynecological patients also coming to the examination, the toilets, everything. So uh, it is important to use a sterile glove always when you are doing a per vaginal examination because the ascending infection can reach uh, from the vaginal canal through the cervix to the uterus to the ovaries and the abdominal cavity. So you are giving access for the uh, microbes to enter into the abdomen. So it's always important. It is um, uh, uh, important to do any examination, per vaginal examination under all aseptic measures. So examination figures are likely lubricated only if it is necessary with the water-based gel or cream. Water-based gel is always better than creams because creams can cause a little bit of irritation. Now going to the next slide, uh, general per vaginal examination or inspection. So now uh, externally, you will be looking into the perineum, external genitalia is observed uh, for any pathological lesions. Now, always, uh, if it is in the later stage of pregnancy, you have to look into if the cervix is in its correct position or whether it has come down, if there is any genital prolapse, stress and incontinence. If the patient is coughing, if there is any stress incontinence, or uh, you can always look into the cervix if there is any leaking or the cervical, all, all those things can be looked into. Now going to the next slide. Contraindications for pervagenal examination in obstetrics. So these are absolute contraindications. In You have to always, when the patient is coming, so wherever I have studied in SDM would be also first lesson we learned is to, uh, to whenever a pregnant patient comes, you have to see the gestational age of the patient first. Before even talking or before even touching the patient, you have to ask for the LMP, that is the last menstrual period. And accordingly, you can calculate the gestational age of the patient. According to the gestational age of the patient, and if there are any previous scan reports, all the blood works done, all those things should be looked into or glanced at once before examining the patient. HB of the patient throughout the pregnancy, we have to look into all the blood investigation, whether it is done or not. So... They, there can be contagious diseases like HIV also. So patient, you, you are also exposing yourself to certain diseases like that. So always look into all the reports. Gestational age, uh, period of gestation should be noted before even touching the patient. If there are any previous scan reports, you have to look into that. So in conditions where there is a suspected placenta previa or low-lying placenta, you are always uh, precipitating the risk of hemorrhage. So you have to... Uh, uh, you have to uh, refrain yourself from doing any pervagenal examination in suspected case of placenta previa or premature rupture of membrane, risk of ascending infection in, in conditions where there is a premature rupture of membrane. The patient had a PROM. In such condition, it is best to avoid the pervagenal examination in a, a very small intervals. Unless and until it is absolutely necessary, don't go for a pervagenal examination. Especially when we are doing our PG, there will be uh, a nurse will be there, we will be there. So uh, you have to make sure who is doing the examination. When the, when the time comes for an examination or pervagenal examination, don't uh, uh, refrain yourself from doing it. Or only one person, either the nurse or you can do it. So uh, that will always avoid the risk of ascending infection. So that is one thing. When consent it is withheld, this goes without saying. So always consent is very important, especially in the, these days. People are actually trying to uh, frame the doctor. Always the doctors are the victims now rather than the patient. So it's all you have to uh, keep yourself clean in all those matters. Now going into the next slide, a diagnosis of pregnancy. There are certain signs uh, which uh, which we have already studied in our third year BAMS portion. So Jack Wimmer's sign or Chadwick sign, there will be a dusky hue. That, that, that is something which is a purple color, something like a pinkish purple color hue. 
uh, seen around the vestibule or the vaginal wall at around the eighth week of gestation, this will help you uh, diagnose the pregnancy without the UPT. So in Corona times, uh, these things will come handy hmm? uh, because the patient is uh, hesitant to go uh, to the laboratory to get the UPT done or sometimes uh, when the, there is a lockdown and all, you can look into these things. But uh, make sure that you, your hospital is also sterile to look into these things. Now, uh, due to vascular congestion, there will be uh, this, these vaginal uh, signs you can see. The soft, there will be, the vaginal balls will be very soft on touch, copious, non-irritating mucoid discharge. So, this is one of the complaints which always the garbani will come. In the early stage of pregnancy, they will say that there is a lot of white discharge, there is a lot of mucoid discharge. So, unless um, it's non-irritant, you don't have to, mucoid non-irritant discharge, you don't have to worry. But if there is, it is associated with any other uh, symptoms like itching or the color of the discharge is uh, not white, something which is yellowish or greenish, then you have to always um, look into uh, whether there is any infection associated. Okay. Then Oceander sign, that is vaginal pulsation increases through the lateral fornix. These things you can see. Now, um, uterine, the size of the uterus during pregnancy, the size will be at sixth week. It is hence egg size. Eight week, it is the size of cricket ball. And twelfth week, the fetal head, the size of a fetal head. The entire fetus is the size of a, of a fetal head. Shape is previously it is by reform in shape. And by twelfth week, it is globular in shape. Consistency, it is soft and elastic. Now, some of the cervical signs are Woodell sign, where the cervix is soft. Little earlier, in case of multiparis, it will be softer in little earlier. Palpate the pregnant cervix. It will uh, feel like the, you are touching the lips. And in non-pregnant, it will be like touching the nose. Then speculum examination, you can see the uh, like how we uh, told in Jacobus and Chad Chadwick sign, bluish discoloration can be seen. Now, Hagar sign. Hagar sign is something which you do during your uh, uh, during the antenatal care. If it is only if it is required, we don't do it for fun. We will do it only when it is required. So most of the times we will skip these signs during pregnancy uh, to avoid any discomfort in the patient. Uh, so Hagar sign is positive. Hagar sign, how it is demonstrated is. Um, like how it is seen in the one, uh, uh, it is just like by manual examination, two fingers in the anterior fornix and abdominal fingers behind the uterus. So it will be uh, approximated with each other. Uh, in, uh, because the, uh, the fetus is too small and it is, cover, uh, it is actually taking only the space of the fundal part of the uh, uterine cavity. So you can actually approximate both the fingers in the by manual examination. That is Hagar sign. Now, Palmer sign is there is regular and rhythmic uterine contraction elicited during the by manual examination between the fourth to eighth week of gestation age. So, after 10th week, it is uh, difficult. Um, uh, so, because there will be prolonged relaxation after contraction. So, that is something uh, which you should do with, uh, before eighth week of pregnancy. Uterus is well defined and firm during contractions and ill defined and soft during relaxation. So that is Palmer's sign and Hagar's sign. Now, during the second trimester, these are the signs. Bluish discoloration of vulva vagina cervix is very more completely, uh, it is more evident, more distinct compared to the first trimester. The softness is also more evident. Internal bellotment. Internal bellotment, you can see the picture. You are trying to internal and external bellotment. So internal development is elicited between 16 to 28 week. Digits in the anterior fornix is slightly pushed in a swift movement to feel the bouncing back. The baby will be bouncing back and forth. So that is internal development. Similarly, external development, you can see you will keep one side of the, uh, you will be keeping it on both sides of the abdomen and one hand will be kept fixed and other hand is moved. Similar bouncing back can be elicited in external development. Pelvic assessment. This is very important as far as obstetric uh, is concerned or when uh, when there is you, you are under you, you are actually assisting or conducting a delivery it is important to understand the pelvic assessment. Appropriate time uh, to do the pelvic assessment will be at term or just before the induction of labor. Definitely after 36 weeks of pregnancy. The procedure is internal examination 
gentle, thorough, methodical, and purposeful. So it should be emphasized uh, that the sterile gloved fingers, once taken out, should not be reintroduced. That is very important. So transverse diameter of the outlet is measured by actually uh, uh, making a fist out of your hand, and it is measured. It is uh, placed. Uh, it is placed in the perineal region and the knuckles of the first interphalangeal joints of the knuckles of the uh, dinged fist between the ischial tuberosity. So if the knuckles are coming in between the ischial tuberosity, there is enough space. If the ischial tuberosity is coming inside the knuckles, then the pelvis is too small. Then during labor, at the onset of labor, uh, you have to do pervaginal examination, which is very important to detect the presenting part of the cervix to assess the progress of the labor. For example, you have to see whether the cervix is dilating as per the contractions of the patient. And if the contractions are good, the dilatation also should be uh, going on simultaneously. So whether there is progress of labor, you have to see if the cervix is two centimeter, three centimeter or dilated, effaced, effacement of the cervix, all those things. To know the bishop score, bishop score is very important to assess the uh, uh, the it is the most important uh, uh, criteria to uh, uh, to know whether the patient is eligible for an induction or not. So that is also one thing. Now, following rupture of membrane, uh, you have to go for a pervaginal examination to ensure that there is no cord prolapse. You have to approximate the head. Uh, if it is not engaged per abdominally, you have to approximate the head into the rim of the pelvis to confirm actual coincidence of bearing down efforts with complete dilatation of cervix. So we have to do a pervaginal examination to see that the patient is actually participating in the bearing down efforts as per the contractions of the patient, contractions of the labor. Now to diagnose precisely the beginning of the second stage of labor also. So these things are important during labor to go for pervaginal examination. During labor, in first stage, why we are going for a pervaginal examination? To look into the dilatation of the cervix in centimeter, to note position and head degree of flexion, to note the station, whether the fetal head station have come to the zero station. According to, if you uh, draw an imaginary line uh, in, in the, uh, uh, if you draw an imaginary line, Above the imaginary line, it will be minus station and at the imaginary line, it will be zero station and below it will be plus station. So, fetal skull may be distorted by caput succedanum or degree of moulding, all those things you can look into. Now, during the second stage of labour, PV should be done at the beginning of second stage of labour to concern the onset of the labour. So, second stage of the labour begins with, first stage of labour begins with the uh, uh, true labor pain or uterine contractions to complete dilatation of cervix and second stage will uh, begin with the complete dilatation of cervix to the expulsion of the fetus. So expulsion of the fetus, you have to understand uh, whether the patient have entered to the second stage of labor to confirm that and position and station of the head, progressive descent of the head is ensured. In third stage, you have to look into the vulva vagina perineum inspected uh, to see uh, after the expulsion of the, whether there is any damage, whether there is any hemorrhage or unattended bleeding is there, all those things can be looked into. Now coming to this, uh, this I have already uh, mentioned, uh, this, uh, the spines are the most prominent bony projection. So if you, by spinous diameter that we have already mentioned, so you can see the imaginary line is at the zero, above it is uh, minus station and uh, below it is plus station head station when the fetus is descending down. Then, um, so PV in obstetrics is very important. So it should be done, done under all aseptic measures and it is it will give you a certainty about, uh, about the progress of the labor. It is very important to keep on assessing the, uh, the progress of labor. So that uh, if there is any, if the, the labor is going to uh, toward any uneventful things, then you can take a, an action as early as possible. Now coming to the third part of my uh, talk today, that is examination of breast. I will, uh, I think the time is also going uh, very fast. So uh, I will try to finish it as, uh, as early as possible. So examination is always assisted by the third patient. So patient will be, uh, any patient coming with the breast tissue will be having 
they will be coming with a complaint of there is a mass in the breast or lump in the breast, pain or discomfort in the breast or nipple discharge. Now, anatomy of the uh, breast briefly, you, you have to understand that the breast lies between the second and the sixth rib, that is between the sternal edge and the mid axillary line. So, two third of the breast is covered with uh, pectoralis major and one third of the breast superficially covered by the serratus anterior muscle, composed of glandular tissue, fibrous tissue, and fat. So, the glandular tissue are divided into lobes. So, lobes will be radiating around the nipples, nipple and areola. Areola is the darker or pinker. The whatever the skin color may be, it will be darker than that. The areola around the nipple. Now, now for examination purpose, we have to divide the breast into four quadrants. So, if you look into this, uh, if you look into the breast, uh, the sternal part will be the inner quadrant, and the mid axillary part will be the outer quadrant, upper and lower. It is divided. Uh, so that when you are locating, it is a universal description. So if you have located a, a lump there and you have written a notes and if that prescription uh, prescription is coming to me, without examining the patient, I will understand that, okay, this lump is in the upper outer quadrant of the breast, of the left breast or like right breast. So it is uh, divided for, uh, for a descriptive purpose. Also, it can be described as per the clock space, like 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock and 6 o'clock. So lesions are located by type, by the distance from centimeters. You can say approximately three centimeters away from uh, the nipple, you can say. It is at the level of 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock. You can express that way also. Now, size and shape of the breast varies with heredity, age, nutrition, parity, lactation, pregnancy, and endocrinal activities. So the how, how, first, we will be inspecting the breast. We have to look into the skin over the breast. So you have to look for any redness, thickness, prominent pores. You know, pure, uh, pure the orange appearance. Like how, how you look into the peel of the orange. It will be um, sinking inside. So because of the inflammation or uh, un underneath the skin, the skin will be pulled inside most of the time. So that is a pure orange appearance. You have to look into the symmetry. Always, if the, even though the patient says that the mass or lesion is on the left, breast, you have to always look into both breast while examination. Both the, exa both the breast should be examination examined simultaneously to look into the uh, symmetry and condor. Condor is you go around the nipple. Um, if you uh, draw so many circles around the nipples, you have to see if there is any prominence or if there is any bulging uh, in the condor or there is any mass or dimpling or flattening. All these things should be looked into. You have to also look into the nipples and areola, the size and shape, if there are any rashes, inflammation, ulceration, if there are any discharges, if it's a milky discharge or blood stain discharge or mucoid discharge, you have to look into all that. Asymmetry of the direction of the nipples pointing. So when there is an asymmetry, you, you have to understand that there is, a, uh, there is some kind of lesion underneath the lip, nipples. So these are the inspection part. These are the axillary lymph nodes you have to assess. Central, you have to go for a supra and a infra clavicular nodes, axillary folds you can look into, subscapular uh, and central and lateral axillary nodes. Now, uh, patient should uh, raise both the hands, look for any dimpling. In certain cases of uh, carcinoma of breast, the, uh, the breast tissues will be attached or the skin will be at attached to the chest wall. Now you have to place both hands of the uh, patient on the hips, look for any dimpling or attraction of the skin. Now the patient should lie down an examination table and preferably you can keep a pillow underneath the breast which you are examining so that the tissue of the breast will be distributed evenly. Uh, so you can uh, look into the breast tissues and while you are palpating also it will be distributed evenly which will help you assess if there are any lumps. Then palpation of the lateral part and medial part is also seen. Consistency, tenderness and masses. So I will skip this. We'll go to the next part. So I have a video also with me, which uh, I will be glad to share uh, about uh, breast examination that you can see. So uh, right now, I don't think there is any time. So uh, I will uh, make it very fast. So if the mass is noted, you have to look into the location of the mass, the size and shape and consistency of the mass, whether it is mobile, tender, dimpling of the skin, near, uh, dimpling of the, any nearby skin of the mass, all those things have to be seen palpate the nipples, you have to press your finger around the nipple.
when whenever you are pressing if there is in one particular part if there is any secretion from the nipple you have to understand that the place you pressed will be is the site of the lesion then axillary nodes whether it is enlarged or tender now normal findings will be bilaterally symmetrical breast breast without any mass and without any discharge from nipples or lipadenopathy so investigations of breast so screening modalities we have to see self uh, care examination uh, you have to uh, uh, have the patient examine their breast every uh, month then uh, at least once in 3 months clinical breast examination by the patient if uh, if the physician is uh, noting any abnormality then uh, we have to send it for breast imaging mammography or if it is uh, detected the hum abnormality de is detected in certain cases you may have to go for breast biopsy so by rats categories we know so it will help you understand the staging of the breast carcinoma then some tumor markers are there uh, which will help you identify the cancer markers in blood urine and body fluids uh, that i have put here so some blood values in urine examination cervical and vaginal smear ultrasonography endometrial uh, or cervical biopsies for uh, these are all the investigations required during gynecological practice in different diseases hemoglobin total and differential count esr serological investigation for uh, infective disorders or uh, sometimes trans, uh, uh, sexually transmitted disorders communicable disorders platelet count for bleeding clotting coagulatory time or coagulation time all these things urine investigation routine and micro for blood sugar protein in urine and also for uh, any infections or, or microbes you can look into microbial examination and if it is if it is suspicious then you can uh, send it for culture and sensitivity in suspected case of urinary tract infection vaginitis all these things can be uh, sent now pap smear it is a very important uh, assessment uh, investigation in uh, ca of cervix so this is hysterosalpingogram to understand especially in uh, infertility to understand the shape and the patency of the fallopian tubes whether the fallopian tubes are patent or open that is the thing and follicular study follicular study is to understand the uh, follicular genesis if the patient is ovulating normally on what day she is ovulating to plan pregnancy uh, in uh, those things you have to go for a follicular study for uterine lesions you may uh, for uterine lesions also you can find out through usg and endometrial assessment endometrial biopsy can be uh, done and uh, for diagnostic purposes like if there is a missing iud and uh, in dysfunctional uterine bleeding all those things you can look for any cysts or anything you can uh, always send the patient for usg abdomen and pelvis investigations in obstetrics we know it is upt urine pregnancy test frequency of antenatal visits like this uh, every month now uh, every month uh, once in every month till 28 weeks after 29 to 36 weeks every two once in every two weeks after 36 weeks every week until delivery antenatal checkup then investigations in antenatal these are the most important in which you cannot miss any of this i will share the uh, this ppt with you so you can look into that some of the other investigations are rh incompatibility btct it is very important to uh, go for an rh incompatibility indirect test if the mother is a negative rh negative patient with an rh positive husband the ptct in certain conditions of abruptio placenta in um, coagulatory disorders it's intravascular coagulopathy they are all very dangerous it's always important to go for a btct it's an important investigation during obstetric practice then in uh, other investigations are urine routine and micro and blood sugar it is very important because it's a, it become a it's a very a uh, common uh, dietary disorder the blood sugar of the diabetes mellitus or uh, gestational diabetes also very common uh, these days so it's important to go for a gtt glucose tolerance test then ultrasonography to confirm pregnancy to uh, for uh, number of fetuses assessment of gestation age in the first trimester itself within 12 weeks the patient uh, have to go for at least one usg to understand the dating of the pregnancy monitoring the fetal growth early detection of any malformation important to have a anomaly scan or fetal well being scan at the 20th week before uh, 20th week of pregnancy gestational age and detection of any poly or oligodramnios assessment of the fetal position location of placenta etc 
Now to set up a normal gynecological practice in Ayurveda also we need all these things. Then some of the uh, instruments uh, for uh, Stanika Chikitsa, we can have these things. Okay, that's it. I think I took a lot of time. Pardon me. I think it was useful for you. Thank you so much for patiently listening. If you have any questions, you can ask me now. Thank you very much, ma'am, for taking your time to prepare for us such an extraordinary, wonderful presentation, which is incredibly informative. Thank My you very pleasure. much, ma'am. We shall, now go ahead. we shall now go ahead for the question answer session. Delegates may post your questions in the live chat box. Ma'am, we have a question from our chat. Uh, Ma'am, what are the indications of doing PV examination to know the different sign of cervix and uterus in the first trimester? Uh, uh, indications. So in the first trimester, as I already told you, it's absolutely... Uh, unnecessary to go for any uh, per vaginal examination because it will elicit Ferguson's reflex. So it may elicit a premature contraction. So it is best to not go for any examination. But at uh, the signs which I told you, like the uh, vest, uh, in the vestibule, you can see dusky hue, uh, discoloration. You can see there is congestion of uh, cervix and mucopural discharge. You can see these are some of the signs which you can elicit during the first trimester of pregnancy and the softness of the cervix. Uh, if you do a pervaginal examination. But it is best to avoid per speculum or pervaginal examination during the first trimester of pregnancy. You can always go for a USG or uh, if the patient is very really uh, hesitant to go for a USG, then you may have in such conditions like a pandemic, you can go for such investigations or examination. Otherwise, no. I, I think I have answered the question or, uh, or was it not clear? It was clear. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, delegates may post your questions in the chat box. I think uh, delegates are so odd out of and so gratified with your presentation that we have very less oh. questions for this session, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, we could we couldn't find any more questions in the chat box, so okay. let's end our question answer session. Thank you very much for answering our question, ma'am. Thank you, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, ma'am. It was really great listening to you today. Thank you. Now I request Dr. Vandana K. Vasudevan, Assistant Professor, Department of Prasthi Tantra and Sri Roga, Ayurveda College, Coimbatore, to deliver the oath of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Anisha. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible, ma'am. A very good evening, everyone. On behalf of organizing team, Ayurveda College Coimbatore and team Deeksha, it's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks for today's session on Dr. Sudhir Raj and Memorial Webinar Series. It's my honor to thank our guest speaker, Dr. Divya Siyas, head of the department and associate professor, Department of Prasuti Tantra and Sri Roga, Shandigiri Ayurveda Medical College and Hospital, Palakkad, for not only sparing her valuable time to grace this occasion, but also for enlightening us on the topic, examination and investigation in obstetrics and gynecology. We are highly obliged, madam. I am also grateful to our principal, Dr. Chandra Maulishwaran, sir, our vice principal, Dr. Tulia Mohandas, madam, for their support and commitment. Last but not the least, I thank all the delegates watching this session live and for your cooperation in making this event a success. Once again, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Over to thank you, you, Anisha. Thank you very much, ma'am. We have now come to the end of the session. The sun sets in the evening today with a promise that it will raise again tomorrow. Here's a hoping that the day comes will be a better tomorrow. See you all in the next session. To know more about our updates, please do stay connected with our social platform. And that's all for today's most interesting session with a lot of information for us to close our eyes with thought-provoking knowledge. Meet you all in the next session. Until then, stay home, stay safe. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.